All right, President Obama <laughs> cited George Washington's farewell address in announcing his own goodbye speech. The first president published his remarks in a Philadelphia newspaper in 1796. His warnings of a parting friend cautioned Americans about the wiles of foreign influence. He stressed the union of the whole. It is a message that is repeated in the Senate every year. The name of America, which belongs to you in your national capacity, must always exalt the just pride of patriotism more than any appellation derived from local discriminations. With slight shades of difference, you have the same religion, manners, habits, and political principles. You have in a common cause fought and triumphed together. The independence and liberty you possess are the work of joint councils and joint efforts of common dangers, sufferings, and successes. The Daily Beast editor-in-chief John Avalon explores the history and legacy of that address in his new book, Washington's Farewell, The Founding Father's Warning to Future Generations. It's published by Simon & Schuster, a division of CBS. John Avalon, thank you for coming. Great to be here, guys. Yeah. So did he, it start that tradition by what Washington said, a sense of warning to the country? Absolutely. So the, wash, the farewell tradition was set by Washington, but there's a deeper tradition, which is the warning, parting warnings from a, a friend, where presidents say, look, I'm leaving the stage, but here's what you need to know. In Washington's case, here are the forces that have destroyed democratic republics before us. So, so it's a warning that the president generally... Absolutely. Encapsulates. Absolutely. And, and Eisenhower's farewell famously captures that in the military industrial complex. But it was published in a newspaper, an open letter to the American people. And based on his lessons from history and his own life, he detailed forces that had destroyed democratic republics before mm -hmm. hyperpartisanship, yeah. excessive debt, foreign wars, foreign influence in our politics, yeah. forces we still deal with today. So it's a remarkably prescient, relevant document. Any guess on what <laughs> Obama might say? Well, I, I, I would not be surprised if he does include a warning, mm -hmm. given the storm clouds on the horizon. And but the it's, so, it's so interesting, as you point out, it's in a newspaper, 6,088 words you said yes. in the first line of the book, the most important speech you've never read because he never delivered it. But it still is relevant today on both sides of the aisle, people are quoting it. Absolutely. And that's one of the fascinating things. You know, this was the most famous speech in American history. It was more reprinted than the Declaration of Independence wow. for the first 150 years of our republic. And different parties at different times and different political leaders have taken comfort from it. Lyndon Baines Johnson quoted it on the importance of public education, uh, that, uh, that we need an enlightened citizenry into, into, in a self-government uh, situation. Um, Ronald Reagan always talked about the importance of religion and morality to a self-governing people. So it's a document that can unify the nation, provide a sense of common ground and common purpose, and God knows we need that right now. And what was the influence of Alexander Hamilton? Hamilton, you know, shout out to Lynn Manuel, yeah. uh, Miranda. Hamilton wrote many of the words. What's fascinating is that the first draft was written by James Madison. Yeah. The second draft, the really deep draft, was written by Alexander Hamilton. Um, and so George Washington got the band back together, who the band of brothers who did the Federalist Papers. But ultimately, the ideas were all Washington. The words may have been Hamilton's in many, but not all cases. But the ideas were all Washington's, and it really is an autobiography of his ideas. Yeah. Some critics like Jefferson and Madison actually changed their mind because of the influence of Washington. They did. And, and Jefferson and Madison were at war with Washington for much of his term. At the end of Washington's second term, he was brittle and thin-skinned, frustrated by attacks in the press and the rise of partisanship. <laughs> he was. And, 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 Hamilton and, 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 and Hamilton and Jefferson were at war in, part, in, in the warring papers at the time. But when Jefferson became president, he all of a sudden became a Washingtonian. He came up with the phrase entangling alliances that many people associate with the speech. So it's also about how when positions of responsibility are assumed, often people's perspectives change. And Washington's core warning to the nation, the principles he set out, remain relevant today, and they tend to be adopted by people once they've reached the presidency. Well, you gave really a gift to the yeah. reader. You include the speech, all 6,088 yes. words in yes. the book. All right, John Avalon. Thank you. Yes. Congrats. Congrats. And Washington's farewell goes on sale Tuesday.